Good morning, Year 12. We're going to start out with some brief feedback on the past paper questions that I asked you to complete yesterday. Uh, the first thing was that there was still some confusion about the difference between a real and a virtual image. This screen shows it all. The important thing is, is that a real image is formed by real rays intersecting. So on your diagram, solid lines, solid rays, will cross at the point where the real image is formed. Virtual images are imaginary, they're where it appears that the rays are coming from, so they're formed with at least one virtual ray intersecting with another ray. For three marks, there are other things we have to say as well. So the classic way of describing the difference between a real and a virtual ray is that a real ray can be projected onto a screen. If I take a piece of paper and place it at the focal length, then if I have a real image, then you'll see an image being formed on the paper. The light is focused at that point. If you tried that with a virtual image though, you would get nothing at all. The rays don't actually cross at that point. We can also talk about whether or not they are inverted or upright, and whether they're formed before or after the lens. Some people missed out on the final question. The final question is taking us into a bit more um, detail, thinking about the differences between converging and diverging lenses. For diverging lenses or concave lenses, you'll always get the same result, regardless of whether you have an object inside or outside the focal point. You'll get an upright, virtual, diminished image. It doesn't matter where the object is, you get the same result. However, for a converging lens, it does matter where the object is. So if the object is outside the focal length, then you will end up with a... <coughs> <clears throat> if the object is outside the focal length, you will end up with an image that is inverted, real, and magnified. That's the top diagram on this slide. If, however, you have an object inside the focal length, then you'll end up with an upright, virtual, and magnified image. You have a magnifying glass. So the final question on the paper was basically asking you to recognize that that was the situation that you were in. The second diagram on this slide. Okay, so why are we talking about lenses all of a sudden? Well, it's because we need to talk about telescopes. This is our starting point for our astrophysics A-level material. Talking about how we observe the universe. We're going to start out with some impressive pictures, because that's always my favourite way to start astronomy. All of these taken with telescopes of some sort. I won't talk over too much of this slideshow, just enjoy it for the next couple of minutes. This picture briefly touches on the idea that we can use different wavelengths of light to observe different objects. We'll come back to that later. So in this lesson, we're going to be able to describe the differences between a refracting and a reflecting telescope. And we'll be able to construct ray diagrams for both of them at the standard required for A-level physics, which is higher than GCSE astronomy, if you've done that course. 
We'll also be able to understand magnification and a potentially a new concept, resolving power. So there are two types of telescopes that we need to be able to construct ray diagrams for. A refracting telescope that uses lenses and a reflecting telescope that uses curved mirrors instead. Most reflecting telescopes also involve a lens for the eyepiece. So you might have seen diagrams somewhat like this, showing what happens in a refracting telescope. This is the much simplified version of it. You have two lenses, and the purpose of this is to take in parallel rays of light from a large objective lens, and to concentrate that light down and produce parallel rays of light coming out of the eyepiece lens. Then our eye is actually the third lens, but we don't have to worry about that. We just want to produce parallel rays of light. A refracting telescope uses mirrors instead. So again, same idea. We bring the parallel rays of light to a focus before they go through an eyepiece lens and are made into parallel rays coming out again. So what's more complex at A level than those diagrams you've just seen? Well, this is a question taken directly from an A-level paper. Draw a ray diagram for an astronomical refracting telescope in normal adjustment. Your diagram should show the paths of three non-axial rays passing through both lenses. Label the principal foci of the two lenses. And there's a few questions that we're probably asking ourselves about now. What does normal adjustment mean? What do we mean by non-axial rays? And possibly some others. And the best way to show you these is just to do it. While I'm going through this process, I'd like you to start writing a series of instructions to yourself about how to do this. I'll make it as clear as I can. If you have any questions, you can always ask. Okay, so I'm just using a simple uh, paint program to draw this. It's probably best if you do this manually yourselves on paper but it is up to you. So the first step is to draw our principal axis, just like the ray diagrams we've done previously. Once we have that, we need to draw our two lenses in. So the first lens, or the first lens or mirror is called the objective element. So we're gonna draw that in now. The objective lens is always going to be a converging or convex lens. So I'll try and show that with some arrows. The power of editing, they appear. We then need to draw on the eyepiece lens. That'll be towards the right hand side of this diagram. We don't really care about the different layouts of telescopes like the Newtonian telescopes where it's on the side. For hours, it'll just be on the principal axis. Now, what does normal adjustment mean? Normal adjustment just means that you've chosen the distance between the lenses carefully. So that the total distance between the lenses, which we'll label on here as X, that distance is equal to the focal length of the objective lens added to the focal length of the eyepiece lens. So this is normal adjustment. And you can see that because we've chosen this distance x carefully, because it's a normal adjustment, then it only has one focal point, which is that point where the focal length of the objective and the focal length of the eyepiece meet. So we can draw that on with a dot. Remembering that we use capital F for the focal point. Okay, what comes next? Well, we're going to draw a ray coming into the telescope. It has to be a non-axial ray. So this is the ray that does not 
come in along the principal axis. It has to come in from a side at an angle. Choose a small angle, not a large angle, otherwise your diagram is not going to work very well. The first ray that we can always draw is the ray that goes through the centre of the lens, the ray that is not refracted. Assuming the lens is thin, that means it will continue through along the same path that it had before. So far, so straightforward. Now we know that there is going to be an image formed at the focal point. That is what this objective lens does. It takes parallel rays of light and it brings them to a focus at its focal point. So if we imagine that these rays are coming from the tip of an arrow, we can see that at distance f, we're going to end up with our image. It will be, as expected, magnified, real, and inverted. So we can actually draw that image in now before we do any additional rays. Once we have the image in, we can start drawing in the other non-axial rays. So these rays are coming from a point source very far away, so they're coming in parallel. So before they hit the objective lens, they are parallel to the original ray that we drew. I'm going to do my best to make this parallel. If I was doing it on paper, it would actually be easier to do so. So that's one ray, and we'll do another one below it. Again, through the parabenting, it appeared magically. These two non-axial rays that don't go through the center of the lens will be brought to a focus at the focal point. So we're just going to connect them up with the tip of our image that is being formed at the focal length. Like that. So what do we have so far? We've got an image being produced by the objective lens, and we have three non-parallel rays hitting the eyepiece lens. What happens next might be very clear, or it might not be clear. The rays of light coming from the tip of the image, it's a real image, remember, are spreading out but the eyepiece lens is going to make them parallel. Why is it going to make them parallel? How do we know that? Well, if we think of it coming in from the other direction, if we had parallel rays coming in to the eyepiece lens, they would be brought to a focus at the focal point. So if we're looking from the right, parallel rays would come in and then cross at the tip of the arrow again. The difficult thing is to work out what angle the rays are going to come out of the eyepiece lens at. However, there is a trick to this. We can draw a construction line. A construction line is just a line that helps us to draw the rest of the rays. It doesn't represent a ray at all. And I'll use a dotted line to do this. This construction line should go from the tip of the arrow through the center of the eyepiece lens. Because we know that all of those parallel rays that are coming into the eyepiece lens from the right would meet at the focal length. And that includes the one that goes to the center and is not refracted by the eyepiece lens. This means that all of the rays coming out of the eyepiece lens will be parallel to that ray. I'll do it and then show you what I mean. So with that construction line drawn, I can then draw in the next three rays coming out of the eyepiece lens parallel to that. Now you might notice some issues with my diagram. First of all, my eyepiece lens has not been extended out far enough. Um, that's partly because I chose quite a large angle for the incoming rays. If it was a bit more acute, then I'd be able to fit those rays on. 
Also remember to try to draw arrows on every single ray that you draw. Whenever they go through a lens or anything like that, draw a new arrow on the other side. Okay, now use your memory to try to recreate that diagram. I thoroughly recommend doing this on paper. Try to use graph paper if it's available. If it's not, then an online paint program or a paint app might be appropriate. Once you've done that, I'd like you to go back and have a look at your step-by-step -step guide of how to do this. Check that you've done everything correctly on there. And then we'll self-assess in a second. Pause the video now. Okay. Now please self-assess your diagram and your step-by-step -step sheet using my step-by-step -step method here. Have you done all of these steps? Have you done them in this order? If you change the order, it might work fine, but there's potential for confusion if you do change it. Pause the video now. This is the diagram that you should have produced. There is a list of common problems that you might have come across. Please check that you haven't done any of these. Okay. It's time to have a look at the other type of telescope we might be expected to draw a ray diagram for. The refraction telescope in normal adjustment is the first one. This is a Cassegrain telescope, which begs the question, what's a Cassegrain telescope? Well, I'll give you straight away, it's a type of reflecting telescope. So it uses mirrors instead of lenses to focus the light. However, I'm going to let you take the lead on this one. Please find a definition for the Cassegrain grain telescope and try to complete the question above. You should pause the video now. Okay, so this is what you should have found. A Cassegrain grain telescope is a specific type of reflecting telescope that uses a parabolic primary mirror to focus the light onto a secondary mirror, which then crosses outside the telescope and then proceeds on to an eyepiece lens. Now, you only had to have two rays, but as you can see, they do quite a lot of bouncing around the place when you draw them onto here. So this is actually only showing two rays of light coming in, hitting the primary, reflecting off, hitting the secondary, reflecting off the secondary, and then coming to a focus. Note that because the rays are coming in and hitting the outside of the parabolic primary mirror, they hit towards the outside edge of the secondary mirror as well. The fact that this diagram has a hyperbolic secondary mirror doesn't matter. It just has to be a convex secondary mirror. We don't worry too much about its exact shape. It is important to note that the primary is parabolic, not spherical. And we'll talk about why that is later on today. Your diagram can be significantly simplified. I draw it horizontally to avoid any confusion. The only change I might make here is that the mirror could be made to look more clearly parabolic. Here are some common errors that can occur. If you draw the two halves of the primary as two separate mirrors, so it doesn't look like a continuous shape, you need to remember that the secondary mirror is going to be convex, and you should include, some, include an eyepiece lens. However, you don't have to show the rays going through the eyepiece lens. When you are asked to do that, they come out parallel. And the rays should only 
come to a focus after they've hit the secondary mirror. It doesn't matter too much if they come to a focus before or after they go through the aperture in the bottom of the primary mirror.